everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to be talking about something pretty darn interesting, I think, uh, that has to do with President Nelson, President Oaks, and something that happened 40 years ago. You're looking at a picture from 40 years ago, 1983, and it's a woman fishing uh, from State Street in Salt Lake City. That's right. This is a street but it's flooded and she's fishing uh, from the street, from the sidewalk right here. And here's a guy that actually, uh, I guess, caught a fish from State Street. You can see the state capitol back there in the background. There's the church office building. And then if you would go further to the left here as we're looking at it, the Salt Lake Temple would be like over here. So there's a river that formed in 1983. And it turns out that right now, 40 years later, they think that this could possibly happen again this year. I'm about to show you. It's really weird because I wasn't like thinking about this really. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd gotten some emails about California and how there's a bunch of snow. And I'm going to cover that. I'm going to look into that because there's like snow in places where there normally isn't snow. There's wild things going on with California. There's a uh, atmospheric river that's hitting California again. We talked about the previous one at the beginning of the year, but it, it looks like it's happening again. And I was thinking about Utah and this just like came to my memory, you know, and I was thinking about it. I was like, that's so weird. It's always been a strange thing for me. I wasn't alive when this happened. I was born after this, but this was still in my memory because I remember, you know, my family talking about it and it would come up from time to time how in 1983, there was this flood that flooded state street and other places. And I always thought that that was kind of like a special event. And now that I'm doing this YouTube channel again, it just like came to mind as I was thinking about California. I was like, that is so weird. I wonder if there's anything to that. I think I should probably, um, you know, look at that, add it to my timeline. Oh, I haven't added it to my timeline yet. Timeline yet. I should have done that before the video. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll add it afterwards. And it turns out that uh, this event may be more significant uh, than what I've ever realized. So, and, and like I said, I think it has to do with President Nelson and President Oaks. So, so stay tuned. Um, Really quick, here's the update on the Book of Mormon Sharing Challenge. So I've decided that we're going to track it, or we're going to highlight whenever, uh, like, the number of shares. Once we reach the next 50, I'm going to highlight that. So the last time we did that was on uh, the 3rd, so about a week ago. Um, <clears throat> right now we're at 384 people that have shared the Book of Mormon and are a part of this challenge. That's two up from yesterday. Please join the challenge. Let me know once you've shared a copy of the Book of Mormon. Use the Gospel uh, Library app. Go to Scriptures. Click the Share button at the top. Share it however you want to. Text, email, direct message, whatever. Uh, and then for <coughs> total number of <coughs> copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared, uh, again, I'm not going to highlight it by thousands anymore. I'm going to do it every 500 that we reach. And so we just reached a 500. We just crossed the 4,500 4,500 uh, mark. We're at 4,512. 4, so good job, everybody. And then uh, 17 missionaries, two baptisms to date. So please do this. When you send me your shares, make sure to make it short, concise, like so it's easy for me to find. And I don't have to like read through like a big, long story. I appreciate your stories, but have your story be something separate. Just short um, comments, please. Okay. Oh, and by the way, this is from Brandon Porter. He uh, actually did this in his ward, okay, the Suncrest ward, and he did uh, a Book of Mormon challenge, and people joined in. And so, you know, maybe this is an idea for any of you that are uh, leaders, you have a class or something like that. Maybe you could do this in your ward. Uh, just a really fun idea. And then I'd be happy to add any of those shares uh, and put it on the tracker. So cool stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at Salt Lake City, in case you're not uh, familiar. <clears throat> okay, first, let's go to the let's go to the satellite. Here's Temple Square. Okay, here's Temple Square. 
here's the church office building, here's the Salt Lake Temple, Joseph Smith Memorial Building, here's the City Creek Center, which is the big mall right there. And then this is State Street. Now, Salt Lake City has a Main Street, okay? <clears throat> and of course, it was called Main Street because, like, this is the zero point right here. Um, Salt Lake City is laid out in a grid the way that New Jerusalem would have been laid out if they had succeeded in Jackson County. So the blocks are in, in a lot of other cities do this, but this is something kind of um, very built into Salt Lake City in the metro area where it's very, very gritty. There's a lot meaning there's a lot of uh, streets that don't have names. They're numbers, you know, like when I was in Phoenix, you had like Thunderbird Street and um cactus street and <laughs> everything had to do with like the desert fire street <laughs> burning street no just kidding I, I don't think there's a burning street but there might as well be um so anyway like here you have second 200 east or second east and third and fourth you know 4500 south stuff like that there's more numbers than there are names for streets anyway so main street's right here but state street really in my mind is the true main street because it has most of the businesses uh, along it. Not so much downtown. Downtown, there are a lot of businesses along main street, but when you go through the rest of the valley, there's more businesses um, along state street and it feels more like main street. And you can see uh, it goes straight up to the state capital, which is right here. Okay. So let's go back to, uh, let's go back to this. I'm going to zoom out. Uh, so you see this yellow street right here. This is State Street. And you can see it, it pretty much parallels I-15, which is the main... This is like the primary uh, freeway in uh, in Salt Lake City. There's other ones. There's like the Belt Route right here. Um, you have I-80 that goes from San Francisco all the way to New York City. And it comes through Salt Lake City right here. Um, Anyway, but I-15 really is kind of like the main, main highway. And then the main street is State Street. So that's the street that we're talking about uh, that, that was flooded. Okay. So first, <clears throat> before we get into that story of like what was going on and what's happening this year, let's take a look at President Nelson and President Oaks. Um, I'm going to rely on this article from LDS Living <clears throat> because as I was looking at the details, I wasn't familiar with this story. It kind of starts with Legrand Richards. He uh, was the he was replaced by President Nelson when he passed away, and he passed away January 11th, 1983. And I was like, what? Because President Nelson he became an apostle in 1984, so that was a year later. Like, was that seat seriously vacant for like a year? And uh, it turns out, yes, it was. I didn't know that until today. There was a seat in the Quorum of the Twelve that was vacant uh, for like over, well, I think, it, yeah, I think it was over a year, uh, which is not a normal occurrence, right? So already starting off with President Nelson, there's some kind of weird stuff going on. Um, some interesting things. There's been a lot of very special things about President Nelson. I, I don't need to tell you. We've been like chronicling that uh, during this this YouTube channel. I have a playlist just for President Nelson because there's so many things to talk about with him. Well, add this to the list. So, okay, so let's go to the LDS Living article. We'll see what it says. On January 11th, 1983... So this is the year of those floods uh, down State State Street and other places, uh, other areas of Utah, but, you know, Salt Lake City. January 11th, 1983, Elder LeGrand Richards of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles passed away. With April General Conference less than three months away, uh, members looked forward to the calling of a new apostle. The call of a man to fill a vacancy in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles is the responsibility and prerogative of the President of the Church. Only he has the authority to receive revelation about, <laughs> about whom the Lord has prepared and selected for that high and holy calling. During the months preceding conference, uh, President Spencer W. Kimball's health, and, health had become increasingly frail and his memory spotty. To the disappointment of many, 
the April 1983 1983 general conference came and went without a call to the 12 announced so the april conference comes and goes nobody fills that spot uh as the october 1983 general conference approached okay so by this point the flooding uh was done okay the flooding was done um it happened between the two conferences as of the october 1983 1983 general conference approach speculation again mounted that this time surely the vacancy in the 12 would be filled but again there was disappointment no one was called conference came and went for a second time with an empty seat in the quorum then on january 11th 1984 a year to the day after the passing of Elder Richards, Elder Marky e. Peterson of the Twelve passed away. So, that is high strangeness. That is high strangeness. You have Legrand Richards, Richards right here. He passes away January 11th, 1983. And then, a year to the day later, Mark E. Peterson passes away. What the heck? And in the middle of that, if you were to pick kind of like a midpoint between the two deaths, that's when you have this flooding, this like weird flooding going on in Salt Lake City. Weird. Okay, so, okay, going back. <clears throat> um, now, there are two vacancies in the 12. And if anything, the situation was more critical. President Kimball's health and deter had deteriorated even further, and his mind was less dependable. To make matters worse, those privy to the situation knew President Kimball was in no condition to receive the revelation to extend such calls. Ah, so what happens now? One of those persons was Dr. Nelson. The week before April 1984 General Conference, Russell's surgical nurse, Jan Curtis, mentioned how excited she was for the upcoming conference because two new apostles would be called. Russell tried to gently tell her that it wasn't going to happen. Quote, I was his doctor. I knew it wasn't feasible. That President Kimball was not well or coherent enough to do it. I explained to her that calling an apostle is the prerogative of the president of the church and that President Kimball was simply in no condition to do that. End quote. So that's weird. And that's very reminiscent of um, the predicament after Joseph Smith died because there was no clear... Uh, direction what was supposed to happen next and that's how we got the community of christ and other you know offshoots um so it's interesting that there's like a parallel here as well right very strange uh, th this whole situation this whole period of time is very interesting all right, moving on. For months, President Gordon B. Hinckley, the only healthy member of the First Presidency at the time, President Marion G. Romney's health had also deteriorated, had left standing instructions with <coughs> President Kimball's caregivers that if the prophet's mind ever cleared, they were to call him immediately, regardless of the hour. Month after month passed with no call. From time to time, President Hinckley looked in on President Kimball, but an opportunity to discuss such a spiritually sensitive topic as the calls to the Twelve never presented itself. Then, at about 2.30 a.m. on the Wednesday morning prior to the April 1984 General Conference, the phone rang at President Hinckley's home. President Kimball was alert and wanted to talk to him. President Hinckley rushed uh, downtown to President Kimball's suite in the Hotel Utah, uh, which, which is the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, where the issue of vacancies in the 12 was raised. President Kimball said simply, call Nelson, quote, call Nelson and Oaks to the Quorum of the 12 in that order. So <clears throat> what's interesting about this is... Um, I don't know that there was much opportunity, realistically, to decline these callings if you were if you were President Nelson or President Oaks. Um, President Oaks had said that he struggled with this a little bit because he really loved his career. He'd have to step away from law. He has a passion for law, 
And uh, are you, <laughs> of course, you're going to do what the Lord wants you to do. You're going to pray about it, receive an answer. But um, aside from that, are you going to say no to a prophet who like barely is coherent enough anymore to make such a call? You know, so it's almost like um, maybe that happened. Maybe his health deteriorated, deteriorated, deteriorated like that to help uh, them accept the call. Maybe they would have just done it anyway. Who knows? I, I don't know if anyone's ever rejected a call to the 12 apostles, but um, it just kind of maybe if if nothing else, uh, it really highlighted the importance that these two uh, join the Quorum of the Twelve. Remember the the last video I did, or one of the last videos, where M. Russell Ballard, he came after, so he wasn't in the Twelve at that time, but he said that he had like the distinct impression that we had just sustained two uh, future presidents of the Church. So, uh, this is not normal. Uh, it's being highlighted by a, a bunch of like interesting happenings in details and timings right it, when you when you think of the number 2 um <clears throat> what i think about a lot in the church is like companionships or you think about like joseph and hiram you think about missionaries they <clears throat> they're usually in companionships of two sometimes three if if the situation calls for it if there's like a odd number of missionaries or something happens um but two, you know, you think about the Bible, the Book of Mormon, you think about Judah and Ephraim or, well, you know, or Judah and Joe, well, probably more like Judah and Ephraim. Um, that's another number in this church is two. And uh, <clears throat> I feel like that kind of highlights something special going on here, that they come in at the same time under such unusual circumstances. And it's <clears throat> highly significant that uh, President Kimball specified in this order, you know, because as you can see, uh, if it had been reversed, then President Oaks would, have, would be the prophet right now. But that's not the way it was supposed to be. And if you watched my, my previous video, or no, if you watched uh, the live stream I did, I think it was the last live stream, we were talking about you know, are these two together, the transition team? President Nelson primarily being the president before the second coming, President Oaks after the second coming. Um, and again, you might say, well, no, it's just going to be Christ. I don't think so. Christ will be king. He will He will absolutely preside, but he's not going to always be here on earth, according to Joseph Smith. I'm, so I'm assuming that there's going to be a position under him. It's probably going to just still be the prophet. It's probably going to be structured the same, I would assume. And so, anyway, let's move on. So, let's see. So there's that, okay? <clears throat> now, and here, here's a church news article where there's, like, more information and stuff. You can uh, look at that. Um, I also wanted to point this out. This is a comment from Dylan Davis. In Oak's recent biography... The, riot, the writer states that President Nelson specifically wanted Oaks as counselor because he would be the next president. Um, that's an interesting thought, because uh, that's probably not always the case. You know, when the prophet calls a, a first counselor, it may not necessarily be that he believes that um, the first counselor will be the next prophet. Uh, because th think about this, think about Thomas S. Monson. You had uh, President Uchtdorf and President Eyring, right? Let me let me look at. Okay, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> Gosh, let's just look up. Um, let's see, Dieter F. Uchtdorf. I think he was the second counselor, if I'm not mistaken. And then President Eyring was first counselor. Yeah, that that's how it was. So uh, with with President Monson, Henry B. Eyring was the first counselor, but you know he he didn't become the president after that, the president of the church. So <clears throat> that's kind of that's something to think about. 
um, that President Nelson was inspired. That's how he was inspired. And that it, it ends up in President Oak's biography. Now, I can't independently verify that. I'm just going off of uh, Dylan's word. And I, I, I don't assume that he's lying. So thank you, Dylan, for bringing that up. So I don't know. I think something special is going on here. Now, let's look at this. So in between that time, between uh, the passing of Legrand Richards and when they're called as uh, apostles, let's look at KSL.com. Looking back at, 1980, at the 1983 flood that sent a river through downtown. Okay, Salt Lake City. Flooding isn't unusual in Utah. In fact, southern Utah felt the effects of it again this past August. However, uh, for Salt Lake and much of Utah, the most memorable flood not only shut down some streets for days, uh, it turned them into rivers. Some streets, such as State Street, were just that, aqueducts to control the problems caused by the rising water. Makeshift vehicle and pedestrian bridges were constructed to allow people to commute to work or wherever they needed to go with as minimal impact as possible. And here's just a, a pretty stunning image. The state capitol back there, there's Enzyme Peak right here. You can see the monument at the top, this little thing right here. And then, uh, yeah, people going over a bridge with this river raging down uh, State Street. So how did the state <coughs> how did the state flood this badly? Unlike floods caused by immediate heavy downpours, the 1983 flood was the result of abnormally high precipitation totals for several months and culminated in weeks of into weeks of issues. And by the way, that's basically what's happening right now in Utah, 40 years later. Uh, I'm going to show you the details of that in a second. In 1981 and 1982, pre precipitation totals were off the charts, according to the Utah Department of History. For example, the September 1982 rain total was about 10 times higher than the average, uh, recording a record total of 4.35 inches of rain that month. A Deseret News front page article from May 29, 1983, wasn't like the, the traditional above-the-fold story. It was bullet points with many reports of where flooding was the worst. Uh, the more than a dozen bullet points ranged uh, throughout Salt Lake to places like Bountiful, Centerville, uh, Levin, or Levin, I think it's Levin, and Pleasant Grove. By the way, I don't know if most of you know this, but Levin, um, I think at one time it was supposed to be the capital of Utah, and it's actually naval backwards as in like the center of Utah, the navel. Um, it is, let's see, live in Utah, right there. You see that? So it's like the navel. Um, I want to say that at one time it was going to be the, it was proposed or it was going to be the state capital as well as like Fillmore, Utah. Um, I think Fillmore for sure. I'm not sure about Levin. 11 or whatever but anyway so not just salt lake city it was a bunch of other places you have um where's circleville isn't it up here give me a second circleville i thought it was up here oh no it's all the way in the heck down there we go back to the article Oh, Centerville. <laughs> Duh. Centerville, Utah. Yeah, I was right. Okay, that's what I was thinking. I was I was confusing the two, but there's Centerville. There's Bountiful right here. That's where I was married um, and sealed in the Bountiful Temple. All right. So all over the place. And Pleasant Grove, that's down in Utah Valley, closer to Provo. Pictures, you know, flooding. Uh, damaged house, uh, a sunken vehicle in mud. Okay. Rising water from City Creek created flooding that threatened buildings and landmarks around Temple Square. Anytime that there's something that happens near the temple, the Salt Lake Temple, I think it's significant. Or, or just, you know, temples in general, but especially the Salt Lake Temple. You think about the tornado in 1999, 
in downtown Salt Lake that nicked the, t- the temple. Uh, that was not coincidence. That was definitely a sign. It was just months before the turn of the millennium, <laughs> you know, and that that's when a tornado, a very unlikely tornado, touches in downtown Salt Lake City. But then you have this. Uh, you have this in 1983. Um, and by the way, City Creek, that's basically a creek or a stream that kind of, it's like in this corner right here of the of the Immigration Creek, and then it comes down here. And, and then what happens? Does it turn into City Creek? Or is this City Creek? Red Butte Creek. There's the avenues. I don't know. I don't know how it works. No, is this City Creek? Yeah, here's City Creek. Sorry. So here's the state capitol. City Creek is like right here. You can't really see it. It's like a tiny, I don't know. But it goes up here into this canyon, into City Creek Canyon right here. See? comes down here. And then it goes uh, right over here. And part of it goes, as we're about to read, part of it goes in front of um, in front of the conference center. See the conference center? There's like, they've channeled it so like a little bit, so it basically goes like right here along the sidewalk. It's just like a tiny, tiny little thing. Let's see if you can see it on the on the 360. You should. Right, <laughs> right here, you see these rocks? There's water right there, and it's uh, City Creek. You see, like, that little bridge right there? It goes over the, the tiny little creek. <laughs> anyway, that, that's what flooded. Um, okay, so rising water from City Creek created flooding that threatened buildings and landmarks all around Temple Square. One way to combat the problems in Salt Lake City was to turn some streets into rivers to divert the water. State Street was one. Another was 1300 South from 6th West to uh, the Jordan River. Um, now think about this. Think about the fact that this is, we're, we're talking about a flood. We're talking about a flood at church headquarters and protecting against the flood. Right? Could could this have been like a forty year warning of sorts uh, that a flood is coming forty years from then? I, I don't know. If this is the year, that would be perfect. If twenty twenty three is the year of the the flood, the uh, the the cleansing of the earth, you know. I don't know. I don't know. But we're just exploring different ideas. Let's see. This is pedestrian crosses uh, thirteen hundred south. Uh, 1300 South is quite a ways, by the way, um, from downtown. Not like a really long ways, but it's a good distance. Liberty Park area. Okay. Remember, remembered all, okay. Remembered almost the most, however, wasn't the damage, but how the community rallied together. Thousands volunteered to sandbag the streets and prevent floodwaters from reaching homes and businesses. Now that... I think there's a symbol in that because that's what we're doing right now as we're trying as we're trying to build up Zion. We're trying to bring others into the ark as a community. We work together as a community. Um, we're trying to save as many people as possible and have them be safe for the upcoming flood. You know, um, there's been a lot of flood imagery lately. There really has. In fact. I think it was last year that you had in in southern Utah, you had um, Enoch, Utah flooding. Yeah, 2021. Of all places to flood, you had flooding in Enoch, Utah. Enoch is significant because he's associated with the second coming. His city was taken up, uh, you know, in that first um, period of Earth's existence temporal existence and they're coming back at the second coming and there was flooding in Enoch, Utah. Uh, there's actually a lot of like a lot of videos that are pretty crazy, but here you can see some of it. So anyway, preparing for a flood, working as a community to uh, protect ourselves, uh, not be victims of a flood. 
you, you can see the symbolism here. Uh, more than 300,000 sandbags were put in place during the floods. Here's people doing that. There's the Salt Lake Temple. I mean, look at this. <laughs> that's it's pretty. It's a pretty dramatic picture. The Salt Lake Temple just right there, and then the floods right here. Um, here you go again. Church office building. The flooding is just like right there, and that that makes sense because again, the City Creek. Um, if you were to look to the left of this picture, that's where the conference center would be uh when it was constructed much later on okay it wasn't ex in existence at that time obviously but um here it is okay so all right that's it for that <clears throat> flood of 1983 this is under an article for city creek the stream remained underground until a record precipitation in the winter of 1982 in 1983. That, that's something that I didn't know. The stream before that time was underground. And then when this happened, it came above ground. Uh, there's all sort of different sorts of ways that you can look at that. Even though the water's not coming from out, out from under the temple, when you have water appearing near a temple uh i don't know i think that's kind of interesting you should probably pay attention to it but um you could also look at it like this that before that time before president nelson and president oaks joined the quorum of the 12 you know still a ways off from the second coming relatively speaking but then before they become part of the, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, you start to get the signs of flooding. The the creek, which was once underground, comes up, and now it's above ground. You see that? And then and then it, it, when it comes above ground, it floods. It, it comes above ground because it floods. So here we are, 40 years later. Um, is something going to happen this year? Don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see. Later on here, it says, when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints completed the LDS Conference Center in the year 2000, part of the stream became, uh, again became visible. The uh, City Creek runs freely by the center in a rough-hewn granite bed accenting the, uh, the building's waterfall. So, we just covered that. All right. Here is a Salt Lake Tribune article. Um... That talks about this possibly happening again this year to, to some extent. Salt Lake City's flooding in 1983 followed a year of rain and snow. Here's what this year's deep snowpack could mean. And it was perfect because I didn't know, I didn't even know about this till today. It just like came to mind. It's like, this is the right time to talk about it. Again, just look at, I don't know, just look at that picture. I'm familiar with these buildings because there, there's so many times I went downtown, especially as a, a teenager it was just always cool going downtown to the malls and just checking things out, visiting Temple Square, going to the Joseph Smith Memorial Building and other stuff. State Capitol. And then here's that. Okay. Um, okay. With the Wasatch Front's above average snowpack this year, memories of 1983 flooding around Utah are resurfacing, with many hoping this spring won't be another round of seeing State Street become a river. Depending on the area of Utah, snowpack totals range from 120% to 203% of the median marks between 1991 and 2020, according to the data, according to data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In other words, Utah is having one of its best years for snowpack in recent memory, with some areas of the state, like the lower Severe Basin, seeing up seeing up to double the amount of snowfall than it would in an average year. Water managers across the state are happy, but the high snow totals in the mountains always brings the possibility of flooding, despite previous years of statewide drought conditions. Here's that picture of, again, fishing out of uh, State Street. Okay, the heavy winter and a sudden warm spring. Bart Barker knew flooding was not just a possibility, but a likelihood. In 1983, 
He was a Salt Lake County commissioner before the county council was established in 2001, who oversaw the county's public works department. The previous September featured several consecutive days of rain, he said, which caused some flooding in areas of the city which, with aging storm drains. That sort of precipitation continued for months. Quote, <clears throat> all winter long, the rain and the snow were heavy, Barker told the Tribune. Really extraordinary levels. As of February 15th, Utah's 20, 2023 snowpack levels are even higher than the snowpack levels on the same day in 1983. Okay, look at that. According to data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, however, preci precipitation kept falling in 1983, which means snowy weather will need to keep up over the next few months for this year's totals to match those of 40 years ago. So it's it's like it's unknown what's going to happen, but it I don't know. There there's potential. All right, here's people doing sandbags. Okay, uh, county voters. So back then in 1983, county voters approved a 33 interesting number a 30 a 33 million bond to make repairs and upgrades throughout the county, including the reconstruction of the North Temple Aqueduct. Barker said it took three years to repair the damage and beef up infrastructure. Okay, so they, you know, obviously when you have something like that happen, you want to learn uh, from that mistake or just prepare for the future so it doesn't happen again. Let's see, cleaning up State Street the day after the street was drained after flood water. I'm sure that sucked, but could it happen again? Though the idea of Salt Lake City flooding amid a years-long drought might be a far-fetched idea for some, the city has had to keep it in mind. Has had to keep in mind it as a, okay. the city has had to keep in mind it's a possibility. The city's public utilities have been have already started filling sandbags, and currently have them available for residents. So, uh, are, are you someone that you know? Do you have sandbags ready if you live downtown? Um, or anywhere where you're concerned about it happening. Laura Briefer, director of Salt Lake City Public Utilities, says that, like in 1983, the city wants to be ready in case the worst, uh, the worst scenario becomes a reality. Um, quote, we are certainly concerned enough to be monitoring very closely, Briefer told the Tribune. We're trying to be proactive. Unlike the 1980s, when the Great Salt Lake, when the Great Salt Lake's <coughs> water levels were plentiful, there are plenty of places where the excess water can flow if needed. Quote, one of the things that created such poor runoff over the last couple couple of years was the inefficiency of runoff because our soil moisture was so low, and uh, so this will be helpful in that regard. Briefer said. The deep snowpack will help the city's water availability and excess water can flow into the Great Salt Lake. However, Briefer noted that noted this year's deep snowpack still won't pull the state out of its drought conditions and people across the state will still likely be asked to conserve water. That sucks. Briefer said Little Dell Reservoir is a big help in preventing flooding. Uh, the reservoir built about a decade after the Salt Lake City after Salt Lake City turned into a river and si situated just above Mountain Dale Reservoir, gave the city the ability to better manage the spring runoff. And here it is right here. Well, where is it on the map? I'm not sure I've, if I've ever, I don't think I've ever been there. Um, Del Res, Little Dale Reservoir, Utah. Here it is. Where is that in relation to? Okay, so it's right there. So here's downtown, and here's the reservoir. So ho they're hoping that that'll help with some of it. Okay. Briefer added, the city and county's current infrastructure is much better suited to handle heavy runoff thanks to improvements made after the 1983 flooding. <sighs> Look at that. Is that like an on-ramp, or is that like the freeway or something? Children pray in f children. Ch maybe they were praying. Children play in front in a front yard along North Temple. I hope their parents are watching them. That's a dangerous situation right there. Uh, when will it feel like s 
like summer, the ultimate decider of whether to worry about this spring's runoff is simple. Weather. In 1983, the cool, damp spring kept much of the moisture in the mountains before the warm spell around Memorial, around Memorial Day gave way. Barker said the spring runoff would come down to whether or not the state will have a typical warming and freezing cycle, or if it will melt all at once, like in 1983. So I guess that was like that was like a big part of it is like you just have it like building up and building up and then suddenly it gets warm and then just just like all comes down the mountain. Um, does he think this spring could be similar to to 83? It remains to be seen. But Barker said he feels the, the snowpack and snow levels in the valley this winter aren't as dramatic. Uh, quote, I don't see it happening to the same degree this spring. I could certainly be wrong, but if it did happen to the same degree, there would not be the kind of damage there was then, primarily primarily because of what was done after that, the voters approving the repairs and the improvements, end quote. Wilson agrees, saying the improvements made after the flood leave the city in a much better position to handle heavy runoff. Wilson said, I think the basic infrastructure that we did then will work now. Well, let's, let's hope. <laughs> Look at this picture. Let's, let's hope they're right. Otherwise, we're going to have uh, more of this kind of stuff going on, which maybe that's a good thing for some people. Uh, not for business owners that could pot- potentially have their businesses uh, damaged by floodwaters. But <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Uh, here's a USGS um report if you're interested in that i came across this but i i didn't care to look through it but if you if you're like really interested i'll put that in the description below so okay so going back to talking about president nelson and president oaks you know it's again it's just it's high it's high strangeness are these two events connected i don't know If these are the two prophets of the second coming, maybe it would make sense that you'd have such a dramatic flood uh, just before they're called to the 12. Maybe. At a time when you have a seat open, you know, you go through two conferences missing an apostle. uh, And then you have the the two, you have two apostles die a year, exactly a year uh, from each other. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That that's the only way I can really interpret it is that maybe that was a warning of sorts, just letting everybody know in a way that we can only see now, now that we're in the future, looking back with hindsight, that uh, these are the two prophets uh, that are to prepare us for the flood, that are going to see the flood and uh, get us on the ark. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, put your comments in the what you think in the comments below i'd like to hear your thoughts do you remember do you remember when this happened were you alive when there was the flooding did you were you in those pictures putting sandbags on state street or other places um do you think that this is significant do you have any additional information to this any other details i'd i'd love to hear uh in the meantime that's going to be it for that um and in the meantime let's do our part to flood the earth with the book of mormon so we just reached um, a 500 mark, getting to 4,500. We'll see if we can push through to 5,000. And of course, see if we can get more missionary contacts and baptisms and just do everything that we can that's within our power before the second coming. And um, I would encourage you to report because it'll help other people share the Book of Mormon who otherwise wouldn't have, like myself, like myself. And uh, there's been other people that have told me that they probably wouldn't have shared the Book of Mormon uh, in some of these cases if it wasn't for this challenge. So that's why I'm promoting this and I'm just going to keep promoting it until, I guess, the second coming and maybe even afterwards if we still have the Internet. All right, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it and share the Book of Mormon. And I'll talk to you guys later.